starting with his entrusted and encrusted crap man. In Henry's court, his servants vied to be as physically close to the king as possible at all times. In case you aren't aware, especially towards the end of his reign, Henry was a tad bit of a lunatic. The more he liked you, the less likely you were to die for looking at him funny on a bad day of his. But naturally, the monarch reserved the honor of being close to his royal person only for a trusted few people, the grooms of the stools. No, not his counselor, personal butler, none of his advisor, the guy that wiped his ass. And during his reign, only four men got the gig of groom of the stool, the most physically intimate position and therefore the most honored of his attendants. These grooms not only helped dress and undress the king before and after the bathroom and, you know, handled the poop brush for him, but in an insane twist, they also controlled public and personal access to the monarch and some of his finances. They even had power over a stamp of the king's signature, which is a major financial tool. Imagine being one of his wives and having to ask the guy who wipes your husband's ass if you can talk to him and he says no. But if he could afford that kind of luxury employee, why was he called the copper-nosed king? Easy. While Henry's kingdom amassed a great wealth and property during the English Reformation by confiscating Catholic monasteries, Henry then turned around and drove England into debt with his overspending and lavish lifestyle. Dude was a complete eclectic and he wanted to buy everything shiny and pretty he saw, so he did. It's reported by the time he dropped, Henry owned approximately 50 palaces, 6,500 plus weapons, 70 ships, 78 recorders, 78 flutes, five sets of bagpipes, and a virginal. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's a type of harpsichord. Not to mention the millions of dollars he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. So it's pretty obvious he was burning through the kingdom's funds, and by the end of his reign, Henry had it down to the pocket change, quite literally. He was forced to lower the percentage of silver in the British coinage to the point that they were mostly copper with the silver coating that wore away from the coins embossed image of Henry's face, starting with the nose, thus copper nose. When Henry's son Edward took the throne, the royal coffers were in a real bad state. But before we get to his love life and kiddos, let's learn about how Frisky runs in the family. It's well known that Henry's older brother, the first husband of Henry's first wife, Catherine, died young. But did you know he had two royal sisters who made his life a living hell for fun? Henry's older sister Margaret was just as feisty as her brother. She was sent to Scotland to marry that country's king, James IV, at just 13. She did produce an heir after a couple years, the future James V, but her crappy adulterous playboy spouse didn't live terribly long. So as a single queen, Margaret wanted to keep up her luxe lifestyle at her brother Henry's expense, which he did not love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but she fell for and married another Scottish noble, the Earl of Angus. Henry's other sister, Mary, had some equally troublesome marriage issues, at least for Henry. He married her first to the elderly King Louis of France, but that monarch passed away very shortly after. A smart woman who recognized being married to a literal senior could kind of work in her favor, made Henry promise her before her marriage if she was to be widowed, her next husband would be a man of her own choosing. Henry agreed, which hilariously was a bad idea but only for him because now a widow, Mary chose to wed a commoner who was Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon. The king was furious that Mary would marry against his will since he had no intention of keeping his promise to her and that her second wedding took away the opportunity for him to make alliances using her. But Mary and Brandon told him to suck it and stayed married till her death. Their descendants included the Lady Jane Grey, the infamous Nine Day Queen. And before he went around dismantling religions to get some nookie, Henry was a devout choir boy. You might know Henry as the king who split from Rome and brought around the Anglican faith, but in his youth, Henry was a vehement supporter of Catholicism and its head. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new palace. He supported the papacy and in 1521 even published a book-length slam poem against the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. He referred to Luther as a venomous serpent, a pernicious plague, an inferal wolf, an infectious soul, a detestable trumpeter of pride, calamities, and schism. In recognition of Henry's forceful piety, Pope Leo the X, I can't remember that number, awarded him the title of Fidi de Defensier, aka Defender of the Faith. Henry was actually going to join the church himself before his older brother Arthur died and left him a throne and a wife to take care of. Scarcely a decade after being called Defender of Faith, Henry led a schism of his own, cleaving the Church of England into the wider Catholic Church after the Pope Clement refused to annul Henry's 16-year marriage to Catherine. Oh, it's time, y'all, because you may have known he was a womanizer, but did you know Henry was also a consistent king? What do I mean? Have you guys ever paid attention to the names of his wives? So, they were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Park. So it went, K 
Catherine Anne, Jane, Anne, Catherine, Catherine. I feel like if Henry had lived longer, there would have been another Anne and a Jane that would have come along and then another Catherine, Catherine. Ironically, Jane Seymour, the middle wife and the only unique name in the bunch, was Henry's favorite. But more on that sappy tale in a bit. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. When Henry's older brother died, he inherited a kingdom and a wife, Catherine, and they remained married for nearly 24 years. During that time, Catherine was faithful to Henry, but Henry was sticking it in any lady he could find, except Anne Boylan, who made him wait. So his answer, annul a whole marriage just to get some. But as mentioned, Pope wouldn't do that, so Henry had to start a whole new religion just so he could. Guess he shouldn't have done that, because Henry gets so desperate to end the relationship with Anne, he makes up allegations, maybe history's rocky on that, of adultery and treason, and had the marriage annulled and her beheaded. Jane had served as a lady-in-waiting to both Catherine and Anne, and I kid you not, Anne and Jane had gotten in actual fistfights because of Anne's jealousy, so just picture a 15th century cat fight. On October 12, 1537, Jane gave birth to Edward, their only male heir, and then died from complications due to the birth several weeks later. This is the only woman Henry had actually truly loved, and the loss decimated him for two years. His next wife, another Anne, catfished him with her portrait. Turns out she's ugly, and they amicably divorce after six months, so she lives out her life in comfy luxury in the country. Smart woman. The next Catherine was all young and hot at the time when Henry was repugnant and unable to walk, and it was more of a classic sugar baby situation. She cheated a bunch and got beheaded. The final Catherine was a grown up mature adult woman, shockingly a widow or two, and of all of Henry's wives, Catherine had the most influence on the court culture, religion, and role of women, and she also persuaded Henry to restore his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to the order of succession. When you marry that many women, however, it's actually easy to see where his heart laid. Years before his death, Henry made plans to build a monumental tomb for himself, but also Jane Seymour. She truly was his favorite queen, the one woman he definitely loved, and the mother of his only surviving male heir. Henry went as far as to confiscate a black marble sarcophagus that was originally intended for the powerful churchman Cardinal Wolsey to be used at the center of their tomb. The monumental tomb was in the works for most of his time on the throne, but during the tumultuous years after his death in 1547, it was never completed. So Henry and Jane were left to rest in peace in what was going to be temporary lodgings in Windsor Castle until said monument was all wrapped up. But it never did, and the kingdom was so bankrupt that it didn't really ever come around. So completing it seemed a little impractical. It had been a long time, and Henry's intended tomb is now actually home to another famous figure. Two and a half centuries later, the sarcophagus became part of an ornate national monument, the final resting place of Horatio Nelson, the great British naval hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anyways, on to his children, because these poor guys were nearly victims of their dad's dirty plan. For the longest time, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, so he decided to concoct what, had it come to fruition, might have been the grossest marriage ever. Although I feel like the Habsburgs would hear that sentence and as a challenge say, hold my beer. Anyways, Jane may have popped out Henry's only official heir, but he did have an illegitimate son by his mistress. Henry Fitzroy, a surname that literally means son of the king, so a hilarious thing to name your bastard child, was named Duke of Richmond. In order to ensure that his country didn't descend into literal war again over lack of male heir, King Henry wanted Fitzroy to be the next monarch. How may you ask? Why marry the boy to his half-sister Mary? This plan got so close to fruition that the cup already had the green light from the Pope. Thankfully, Fitzroy was in love and married someone else. When Fitzroy died at age 17, it left the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne. Thankfully, as mentioned, Jane ensured both daughters as well as the son got their chance. And speaking of Fitzroy's half-sister, Bloody Mary, she wasn't the only family member that wasn't all there. Henry the Heck Dick is next. It's widely known that quite a few of these famous noble and aristocratic lines were also plagued by mental illness. Various theories have pointed at Henry's syphilis and brain injuries as possible causes. After all, it would be logical to assume that the damage occurred to the frontal lobes from having a horse buck him off twice. That region of the brain processes impulse control, external cues from other actions, and social and lustuous behavior. He also began to comfort eat around this period. Everyone's heard of that person who's had a stroke and just wasn't the same afterwards. So brain damage likely could be the explanation. In 2020, researchers actually discovered what they believe is the site where Henry received the blow to his head that could have caused traumatic brain injury. But it might come down to hereditary psychiatric problems in the family. His paternal great-grandmother, Catherine of Valois, was the daughter of the famously mentally ill King Charles III. Her family's psychiatric issues seem to have been passed down through generations to multiple British monarchs. In his later years, Henry had a significant personality shift towards paranoia, fits of rage, depression, and anxiety, and he sent crowds of prisoners to the Tower of London. He sent more men and women to their deaths than any other English monarch and estimated 57 to 72,000 people. Yikes, dictator numbers. But one thing about Henry, no matter how unhealthy homeboy got, he earned that chuck.
of. Huge misconception. Henry was only morbidly obese in the last few years of his life. For a long time before that, however, he was one of the most handsome and hella fit men of his era. Dude was well over six foot and had a 34 inch waist. In 1536, Henry was taking part in a tournament when he fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, leaving the king unconscious for several hours and forever altering his cheerful outgoing personality. This is the second horse related mass head injury Henry sustained. After this injury and the further ulcer development in his legs, Henry was left pretty much unable to exercise. His made to measure suits of armor chart the king's expansion with his final set around 1540, suggesting he weighed more than 300 pounds within a waist of 54 inches. As a matter of fact, Henry was so overweight he needed a mechanical device to help him get in and out of bed. When he died in 1547, he weighed nearly 400 pounds with a 60 inch waist. Impressive in a time before 10 cheeseburgers for $10, but I mean if you're over 50, ruled a kingdom, injured his health for around 30 years, you can just let go, who cares? And last, but never the least, Henry was a hypochondriac king. Henry was obsessed with sickness and disease, specifically the sweating sickness and the plague. This is pretty fair, by the age 30 he'd already caught smallpox and malaria a couple times. Anytime there was an outbreak of anything, he would minimize his risk of infection by straight up leaving London and limiting the number of ambassadors he saw. Even when Anne Boleyn caught the sweating sickness in 1528, Henry said peace and stayed far away until she got better. Henry, bad husband. Good infection minimizer though. Naturally like any germaphobe, Henry was doing the most to feel clean. So he was known to self medicate. He even wrote his own prescription book which detailed how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. He diagnosed himself with so many illnesses and disorders that it was actually hard to keep track of all of them. From migraines to insomnia and gout, Henry's life was spent dealing with and or avoiding various different diseases and ailments. Despite his many tyrannical qualities, Henry wasn't all that bad. He actually improved English medicine due to his outlandish paranoia, bringing the country further into the renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, the king also passed seven different laws to control the practice of medicine. In 1540, Henry pushed through one of the earliest laws to regulate drugs. Apothecary wares had to be checked to make sure no one was defrauding honest customers. His reign also contributed to the increase of supervision of sewers thanks to his chancellor and future victim Sir Thomas More, who drastically improved the quality of London's public water supply. Kicking off the list at number 10, who is Caligula? Before we dive into the mad Roman emperor's love boats, let's just remind ourselves just who we're talking about here. The third Roman emperor reigned from 37 CE to 41 CE. Gaius Caesar, aka Caligula, aka the Roman emperor at the time, apparently who was a little too close to his horse. Yeah, you may know him from this story, or stories you may have heard. He gave his horse a marble stall, and it got to the point where they were so close, they were homies, him and his horse, little horse homies. Caligula was very close to appointing the horse to the high office of consul, but Caligula was sadly taken out. Imagine if he had lived and this happened though, what would those meetings look like with that horse there? Or what would they smell like, rather? Caligula was cruel, historically. He was awful to members of the Senate, and yeah, as you saw from the title, the guy had a pleasure boat. Or two. I had a paddle boat growing up. Close enough. Both P's. Pleasure boat, paddle boat. It's in there. He ordered for not one, but two of these massive yachts to be built for, you guessed it, a good time. Number nine, Jabba the Hutt. Star Wars, yes, the super cool thing that a lot of cool people like and have never been made fun of for enjoying said property. That's a lie, they get made fun of a lot. My personal favorite Star Wars movie, Return of the Jedi, features a scene on the very sandy planet of Tatooine, featuring a fat slug, a hole with tentacles, and a girl in a bikini. Sounds like something you wouldn't find on Disney+. Plus. However, what I'm getting at is the similarities between Jabba the Hutt's pleasure cruise and Caligula's. Both are tyrannical leaders, extremely wealthy, and slimy enough to weasel their way out of anything. Well, that and them being overthrown. They, they both got overthrown, it's pretty sad. Nah, actually not really, it was pretty cool. Both vessels had friends in low places, extravagant parties until they both sank. One in water, the other in an unholy pit of teeth and tentacles. Number eight, two ships. This guy just couldn't have one ship, you know, just one write off maybe to get some nasty deeds done every now and then out on the water alone where no one can hear, see, or smell or witness what's happening. No, he had to go and order two ships, just in case, you know. The Nemi ships were both built by Caligula and today we consider them floating palaces. I mean, look at these things. Back in 1928, an archaeological mission kicked off. And thanks to this discovery, we have now a much better idea of how Romans sailed so gracefully into the sunset. But of course, as you may have guessed, not all pleasure boats last. Number 7. You sunk my battleship! El Duce Mussolini, trust me I'm going somewhere with this, mustache man's less impressive fascist friend was a man on a mission. He was going to restore Italy to its former glory, to when Italy was king. 
El Duce had a strange affection for the Roman Empire. I mean, can't blame him. The Roman Empire is pretty cool, right? This fixation on restoring the Roman Empire led El Duce to finding many artifacts and historical sites from that time period. So when they were discovered, El Duce was riding high. Italian troops were on tour in Africa. The war was looking good. Everything was just peachy. What could go wrong, right? Well, Allied troops landed in Sicily, and the locals and the criminals of the area were supporting them, and it wasn't looking too good, actually. World War II was raging on, and Italy was a prime suspect. During the ensuing battles of Italy, the once legendary Caligula pleasure cruise was destroyed in the crossfire. Kind of sad, actually. Some blamed Germans, some blamed Allied artillery attacks, whatever the case may be. The vessel from history was lost forever. Number six, rotating statue. Ships used to have some pretty impressive pieces of art. Some went a little overboard, pun intended. Definitely, definitely that time, of course. These ships contained a rotating statue platform, but just what does that mean? What were you, like, what are we talking about here on a ship this long ago? How can you possibly rotate a statue on a boat? This is so heavy, how? Well, the first ever thrust ball bearing, that's how. This idea was originally thought of by Leonardo da Vinci previously, but this was one of the earliest uses of it in real life. Antique ball bearings. You mean my old roller skates? Because those things never worked. Always so much sand stuck in them. The first glide, you're like, done. <laughs> Does not work. Number five, textbook bougie. Caligula was known for his excessive life on land, so you can imagine what it was like on the water. A boat that was filled with all kinds of things the common folk couldn't even dream of. Eating grapes off the vine while it's laying on a silk bed doesn't even begin to cover it. Enough food to feed an army, enough wine to drown Andre the Giant, and enough bedroom misconduct to give a certain website on the internet content for weeks. Seriously. Caligula had some issues. Dude was straight whack. But he has a boat, and, and that's cool. And I want to be cool, and Taylor wants to be cool, and hey man, can we come aboard? Number four, hot and cold. Back in September 1827, Anicio Fiscata Dobe dove down in front of an audience, of course, to collect fragments from these lost ships. He took mosaics, bricks, nails. Thing is, most of these things that he recovered, these artifacts, were either sold or damaged. Yeah, he published his work later in 1839, but by that point, the project was basically scrapped. The recovered wood was now damaged, so the planned souvenirs couldn't even happen anymore. The whole thing was just a mess. Or was it? Both ships had several hand pumps, and the oldest example of a modern day bucket dredge was found. Ancient piston pumps, what do you know? This is a pretty good discovery, I don't know. Can't be Caligula and not have hot water, right? Come on, can't be shivering, being like, what's up ladies? Yeah, grab a beer, oh sh Number three, Big Chonker. This boat was thick. Thick with two C's, an absolute unit of a vessel. Just down bad, homie. All jokes aside, it was quite large. 70 meters long and 20 feet wide, which for the time was massive. Scientists and archeologists up until the discovery were skeptical if the Romans were even capable of constructing vessels this large. Like these speculated large grain haulers. Honestly though, it was wildly impressive how big this ship was, given for the time. Ship making was more of an art then than a means of production or mass production, and the efforts for doing so must have just been massive. I'm using the word massive a lot because it's massive. I passed a woodshop class once, maybe I should give it a try. I can have my own pleasure cruise, maybe with just a little less blasphemy, just in case. Number two, darker history. April 9th, 1927, Mussolini announced that he's going to recover these lost ships, okay? This guy ordered to drain the lake. How extra is this? Hey, I'm gonna find that ship. Um, yeah, let's just drain the lake instead of finding something like an apparatus to go and get it. That's great, that's easier, for sure. Two sites were set up, one near the mouth of the lake and then one on the other side, of course. And slowly but surely, as each month passed, the first ship started to reveal itself. By January 1930, the ship had been emerged completely, and by the end of 1932, the second wreck, too, was recovered. Come 1936, both ships were put in the new museum of Roman ships, but, well, Andrew explained what happened with those ones a little earlier. Number one, Lake Dweller. Where do they find such a legendary ship? Hiding in a secret vault of old Roman treasures like an Uncharted? Well, sorry, Nathan Drake fans, no. The legendary vessel, or vessels, was actually sitting at the bottom of a small lake, which is confusing because looking at the lake from a modern view suggests it was kind of just floating there. No rivers or body of water large enough connects to get a boat that chonky in there. It was speculated in the 1500s that there was a vessel in the lake, or underneath it, but it wasn't until El Duce himself found it that it was confirmed. I mean, he didn't find it, people found it, but he he's a dictator, he takes charge for it, sure. This is why I have an appreciation and a fear of water that I can't see the bottom of. Okay, yeah, I've got a chance to find a huge piece of history, maybe even a little wealth, too. Or I could find the Kraken, or Old Bessie, or a Megalodon. 
there's too many sea monsters. Not so British after all. If you're like me, then you're most likely not gonna be royalty. Although being a prince would be pretty cool, I just don't have the pure bloodline to be royalty, but neither does the Queen of England. When you think of old Blighty and her royal throne, you think of pure British descent, but you'd be wrong. The House of Windsor is actually Saxe Coburg Gotha, which, if you couldn't tell, doesn't exactly scream tea and crumpets. The German sounding name became an issue in the early 20th century due to the First World War breaking out against two time war loser Germany. Britain needing to inspire its citizens to defeat Germany, which at the time it was really anyone's game. So, to help inspire the people, King George V changed the name to Windsor. After all, it's kind of difficult to fight someone when you have more in common than differences. Not to mention that there were a lot of Germanic influences around, so really, it was a bad look and a great marketing decision. At number nine, Charles the Tampon? Yeah, we're getting weird. Relationships are kind of weird. I mean, they can be great, don't get me wrong, but they have a weird side too. Every couple is different and they have their thing. Some have a show that they like to watch together, others have their songs, and some have little sayings that they've come up with. But those are the more tame quirks that some couples have. Others, however, can get very bizarre, but many of them probably can't add up to the strange things that have been said between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. As we all know, Prince Charles was first married to Princess Diana, and it's no secret that they had a pretty tough relationship. Theirs was certainly not a happy marriage, and they each had their own affairs with other people while they were married. During their marriage, Charles was still pretty hung up on Camilla, the woman he was told he couldn't have, and who was also married to someone else. This minor obstacle, however, didn't stop them from getting freaky, at least over the phone. In 1992, the year that Charles and Diana announced their separation, a steamy phone conversation between Charles and Camilla was leaked, and it was super weird. In the call, Charles was simping like no other, saying things like how he wished he could live in Camilla's pants as a pair of panties, and even expressed his desire to be Camilla's tampon. Like what? Charles, stop it. Ew. This leak became a scandal called Tampon Gate, and as you can imagine, this wasn't good for the royals. But I guess it still kind of worked out for Charles since after all that he finally got the girl he wanted and perhaps got to live out his dream of being a box of Tampax or something. I don't know. I really don't want that mental image. Moving on. Number 8. Comrade Cousin? King George V and Tsar Nicholas II were rulers of vast empires in the early 20th century. You'd think the similarities between these two monarchs end there, but in reality, these two royal men were much closer than the public thought. Georgie and Nikki were first cousins. That's right, first cousins. Even though their respected empires were culturally different and separated by hundreds of miles, the two men were immediate family. Looking at images of the royals together doesn't require a DNA test to understand that they're related. They look identical and could easily be mistaken for twins. Unfortunately for Nicholas, when the Russian Revolution was in full swing, the Romanov family went into isolation after Nicholas abdicated his throne. While there, there were attempts to thwart the coup. Nikki's cousin wasn't the best aide. Just goes to show you that sometimes you can't rely on a guy who looks exactly like you because royalty has pretty messed up bloodlines. At number seven, killer date. What is the worst date that you've ever been on? What kinds of weird people have you met through your dating history? I'm sure there are some pretty wild and crazy stories out there, but I'm guessing that very few of them would even come close to the insane dating story from Princess Beatrice and how she literally dated a killer. In 2006, when Princess Beatrice was 17 years old, she got into a relationship with an American playboy named Paolo Luzo. Paolo was an arguably shady guy, judging by the fact that he was arrested on a manslaughter charge before getting with Beatrice. Paolo was accused of ending the life of 19 year old Jonathan Duchalier after beating the guy to death. Yeah. What a catch, right? Shockingly, Paolo's charges were reduced to a less severe charge, and he still got to date a princess after all of this. He even broke his probation to go on a trip to the French Alps with Princess Beatrice. How he finessed life so hard, I have no idea, but either way, their relationship only lasted a short amount of time. I can't say it's a good look for a member of the royal family to be seen with someone with such a dark past. Number 6. The Princess the tragic loss of Princess Diana affected not only the UK, but people around the globe. She was known for her courage and her willingness to help those in need, and had the nerve to speak her mind. Her shocking demise isn't met without controversy. In fact, it may be the biggest controversy of the royal family. There is some evidence that points in the direction that the royal family was behind her death. Diana had proclaimed to her guards that her car was having issues, and 
even stated in a private letter to her butler that she had some reasonable fear that her life was in danger. In a nutshell, the royal family disapproved of the princess's new lover, even though Charles had clearly been up to no good himself. So in order for Charles to remarry and stop the gutter storm and the tabloids that Diana was going to create, they maybe sort of organized the accident that did end her life. Well, good thing that's over and after this, there won't be any more controversy for the family, right? At number five, sucking toes. The British royal family are considered celebrities. I mean, with the amount of time people spend obsessing about their every move, I'd say that they're ten times more famous than the Kardashians. They don't need their own reality show for people to keep up with them. People just do it. With this obsession with the royals, obviously comes paparazzi trying to get the latest scoop on members of the family and what they do in their spare time, as well as who they're canoodling with. This was how Sarah Ferguson was exposed for seeing other men shortly after she and Prince Andrew separated. Sarah was photographed topless on a beach with a man named John Bryan, and it could have just been a juicy story by itself, but things got weird when pictures were published showing the man sucking on Sarah's toes. This again wasn't a good look for the royals, and the queen was pretty mad about the whole situation, but I'd like to look at the bright side of this. Think that this John Bryan guy had a pretty good time throughout all this. I mean, he got to suck royal toes and be published in the newspaper. Sounds like a pretty lit time for him. Number 4. Party Time British royals are people of high esteem, morals, and cut from a higher quality of cloth. So when members of the royal family are seen partying too hard, well, it's a bad look. Prince George, Duke of Kent, was one such royal. He became known for spending his evenings in the best hotels and ballrooms that money could buy, even sometimes wandering into venues that were a tad tawdry even by today's standards. What's more interesting than that is the prince living the life of a frat boy is that his promiscuous relationship with not only just women, but men as well. Add in substance abuse issues that would make Charlie Sheen blush, and you've got yourself one wild prince. Yet again, there's some private letters that seem to support such wild accusations. Unfortunately, he passed away in a plane crash that is shrouded in mystery, and the royal family is suspected of having a hand. Foreshadowing much? At number three, the milkman's son. By far the most scandalous royal relationship of modern times was without a doubt Prince Charles and Princess Diana's marriage. We all know how messy their relationship was with the love triangle, the affairs, and Diana's confessions of how tough it was to be married to Charles. But one of the other pretty juicy secret scandals that surrounded the couple was the speculation that the couple's youngest son, Prince Harry, wasn't even Prince Charles' biological kid. In a tell-all interview with Princess Diana in 1995, she admitted to having had a five-year long affair with a military man named James Hewitt. After Diana's passing, people started speculating that perhaps this James character was actually Harry's biological dad. I mean, when you take a side-by-side -side look at James and Harry, their resemblance is pretty uncanny. James denied all allegations, and the royal family did the same, but this still remains one of those royal secrets that I'm sure everyone believes, but just won't admit. Number 2. Step Bro? Yeah, I know it's gross, but the truth of the matter is, none of us would be here if it wasn't for a little inbreeding. Royals just tend to turn that dial up to 11. Back in ye olde times, bloodlines had to be maintained, and the only way to keep them pure was to marry cousins and have children. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are both related to Queen Victoria, but the crazy bus doesn't stop here. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were first cousins, and they had nine children together. This is a tradition that all royal families practice. Of course, marriage back then was more of a business decision or a political one. It's why certain distant cousins end up ruling different monarchies and empires. Sure, I get it. Why cross the street when you can cross the hall? But at some point, you gotta run out of cousins. Let's just be glad this practice is of the past and stays in the past. At number one, long lost family. The royal family is known for trying to make themselves look perfect in the eyes of the public. They are always trying to look poised and put together and without flaws, but this effort also comes with its dark side, and there's a dark royal secret that just shows the lengths that they have gone to to make people think that they are all just perfect people of society. It turns out that the queen had secret cousins that very few people knew about. The royal family and everyone adjacent are very well known people, so how did we not know? 
know about the Queen's cousins? Well, that's because they were essentially shunned and shipped off elsewhere because of their mental states. Back in the 1940s, mental disabilities were not very understood and were often seen as embarrassing for the families of the people who had whatever disability. The royal family thought that these cousins, Nerissa and Catherine, were too embarrassing for the royal family to keep around, so they had them incarcerated in a mental institution and they remained there for the rest of their lives, cut off from the rest of the royal family. Number 10. King Edward VIII Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. Yeah, Nostradamus, he may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age, they will change the kingdom, and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings, or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members, but either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus' words very, very seriously out there, so I had to include it. Maybe there's something there, I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3. You know, maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, could Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what, that's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and it left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history and well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it, I'm just saying, Kind of nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819, and Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So, on one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. Imagine, that's like some ancient Egypt. Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where 
things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenly spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms, we woke up early, and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan just walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people watching at home or streaming it. And it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before. So of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that, and for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore. Which, more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little pissed too. There's no way though, the guy can't even unlock his email, let alone sending one, no way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy, a princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, well, there's three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was busy looking other directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now, later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see you go to theaters or anything. Kind of snuck by me while I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal, the bad boyal royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005, because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party, and, a uh, few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this, it's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night, it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket. 
while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also Missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out. No idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows a route in, and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What? Like that's, that's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have King Henry VIII. We'll start off this list with some 1500s dating drama. I love it. The fourth wife of Henry VIII, Anne of Cleves, was married to King Henry for six months. It was seen as quite strategic, actually. See, Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's duke, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein, famous painter, travel all the way to Cleves to paint paint a portrait of each sister. This is like ancient Tinder. It's wild. This man compared portraits for a few days and then finally chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. He even compared her to a silver moon. I've never heard Taylor compare me to the silver moon, so it seems like he's got to step his game up. So eventually a treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because when she arrived, she apparently looked nothing like the portrait. How horrible is that? It's 6 a.m., you just met your new husband after traveling upriver by barge, and the dude has the audacity to say you don't resemble a Victorian painting. Awesome. He even tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. Imagine still having to follow through. On January 6th, 1540, their marriage was official. But soon after, Anne gladly accepted the divorce, then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Historians believe that it was cancer. In our number nine spot today, we have King James. Before I dive into this one, guys, don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. It does really help us out. Not to be confused with LeBron James, this is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Quote, use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air to enter, and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick, you'll be well on your way. Like, bro, I have pneumonia, please help me. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick, so King James IV apparently just never took a bath, and his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by being in the same room as them. Even if he was in a room hours prior, but he would give you lice. Doesn't help that the guy had long hair. Guy's got Steven Tyler hair. It's like a lice lunchroom in here. Lice would emit off of this man. Margaret Tudor was married to King James the fourth that must have sucked so itchy in our number eight spot today we have king george the fifth when was the last time you saw a stamp i haven't seen a stamp in months but king george the fifth but he loved stamps 
maybe a bit too much. It was taking many hours out of his days, even when it shouldn't have been a priority at all. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everybody is trying to stay alive, George is just licking stamps in the library adding him to collections. Like all collections, the king started at an early age, but in the end of his days, George had albums and albums and albums, so many stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. That's so many stamps. In 1905, George set an all-time stamp record. It was the most money ever spent on a stamp. The man dropped like 220,000 on one stamp. That's some Logan Paul shit. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps. Or rather, the King of Philady. That's the official term for collecting stamps. Some stamp jargon for ya. There you go. Welcome to Bumblebee. We're learning. Smash that thumbs up. In our number seven spot today, we have King Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector. Some princes collect stamps, others collect zoo animals. A little more badass, if you ask me. His castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep. He also collected human artifacts. So, yeah, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Imagine having company, don't step in lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Cheers! King Rudolf II, he's quite important in history. He supported the scientific revolution quite a bit. He also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff too, besides the kidneys and kangaroo collections. In our number six spot today, we have King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians, let's do it! King George IV was too invested in his intimate conquests. He was focused on all the wrong stuff, and he was also just horrible about it. This king tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw tantrums if a crush wasn't interested, and sometimes he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get their attention. Super creepy, because on top of the lengths he would go to just to get some time alone, he also kept some of their hair after the dirty deed was done. Yeah, he would ask everybody he slept with for a lock of their hair. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair. Just envelopes of hair. The collection was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa. This insane collection is now in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want to feel sick. In our number five spot today, we have Christian the Seventh. Christian. An ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The young prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. Let's mention him. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, as I said, a wee young lad. And of course, a wee bit spoiled. Very comfortable with his body though, I'll say. More often than not, he would just have his hands in his pants. Middle of dinner, passing food around to his family, alternating hands in the pants to hands on food. This should have been number one, now that I think of it. What a little it's unknown, but historians believe maybe he was a wee bit mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks so much. In our number four spot today, we have King Henry VIII. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII. He's pretty bad. Henry VIII was the King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, and they all went south. When Henry married Catherine Howard, he was 49, and Catherine was a lot younger. Classic 1500s stuff. After the two were married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had since received a nasty jousting wound to the face, was gravely overweight, and never wanted to do anything with Catherine. So Catherine, of course, just wanting some shred of a life and being, again, quite young, decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s. The young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. She was accused of cheating before they even got married and in turn lost her head. Horrible times. In our number three spot today, we have Don Carlos. Prince of Asturias in the mid 1500s, the Spanish prince who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was a horrible person. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him physically. That sucks on one hand, but it's how you deal with it and how you deal with others that shows what type of person you are, let alone leader. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, so right off the hop, easy promotion. 
all about who you know. Don Carlos would hurt people a lot. He would hurt animals for fun as well. As a true crime enthusiast, you know that's a red flag. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made somebody eat a pair of boots. We're not gonna feel bad for Don Carlos on Bumblebee today. No, sir. He was set up to marry Elizabeth of Valios, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's absolutely no way in hell, so she married his father instead, King Philip, in 1560. In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos, Mary, Queen of Scots, Margaret of Valios, and Anne of, of Austria. When Carlos was plotting to take out his own father, he was caught and imprisoned in solitary confinement until his death six months later. In our number two spot today, we have the personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst job to have or the best. Here we go. Royals have been sweating constantly about people trying to take them out. Taylor has mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying. People are terrifying. Boy Jones would go through the queen's drawers. Big ew. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate an attack, be as safe as you can be. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you ever heard about this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, and they also had a guy get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter. King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure his bed wasn't poisoned, so you were required to make the king's bed every morning. But you also had to rub all the sheets down before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure that they weren't poisoned. Sleep tight, all safe here. Don't mind the bad breath on all of your pillows. You're safe though. All right, time to clock out for the day. Clothes as well, that was touched. Maybe not kissed, but for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, no way I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off. In our number one spot today, we have King Louis the 14th. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the royal household. Back in the olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis the 14th. Guy loved enemas. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier by using almond milk. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out the almond milk. Like, not again, Louis, come on. I just ate, man. No. <laughs> Kicking off our list at number 10. Princess Diana. We'll start with a tragedy right off the gate. Here we go. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, he straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla right before his divorce from his first wife, Princess Diana. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed that relationship and what exactly happened. During that famous 1995 interview with BBC, she couldn't have said it better if I'm being honest myself. Diana said, very confidently, well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. That's a Princess Diana roast, folks. Oh no! Yeah, Princess Diana, she's full of roasts, apparently. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was a little busy, it seemed, and rightfully so. Diana's like, yeah, I'm not hanging out with this guy. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only a year before her tragic accident took her life. Later in 2005, he married Camilla. Yeah, has anybody seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looks great in that movie, and I wanna know if it's worth the watch. Comment down below. Number nine, The Great Fire. One of the most wild Nostradamus predictions of all time. It reads, the blood of the just will commit a fault at London, burnt through lightning of 23's the sixth. The ancient lady will fall from her high place, several of the same sect will be killed. Now, there are of course many people who believe that this entry here was actually one that predicted the Great Fire of London that occurred in 1666. The line 23 is the sixth and times 20 by three, and then you add six, you get 66. Right, quick math. But most importantly, it may also mention London and the royal family. And in real life, this fire did affect them as well. Also, it is said by many that the reference to the lady here is another term for the kingdom, the lady. This means that Nostradamus was predicting, maybe, that the kingdom was going to fall as a result of the Great Fire. So, yeah, he kind of nailed it. I don't know. Number eight, King James. Not to be confused with LeBron James, although he's, he's a pretty good king as well. He's, he's all right, that fellow. This is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. 
Don't do it or else you're a sinner, I guess. Use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, what? What did you just say? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles, like it's a Harry Potter spell, you know what I mean? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor is like, ah yes, just a, a flower petal, we'll fix that. The doctor was one of these, comes in? No way, I'm not listening to that guy. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick, so King James IV, apparently he never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by walking by them. He would walk by and they'd be like, Ugh. Guy's got Steven Tyler's hair, what is that? Like, can we cut it if it's infected with gross? Can we just, maybe a bald king? How does a bald king sound? Number seven, King Rudolph II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector of sorts, these, these royals. They like to collect things, they like to spend their money on weird things. Some princes collect stamps, other collect zoo animals. See, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep, my friends. He also collected human artifacts, this royal, so that's a bit odd to collect when you're a royal. Imagine having company over, you're like, yeah, watch the lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Do you want a drink? Let me get you a drink. King Rudolph II, okay, he's quite important in history, obviously. He supported the scientific revolution a lot, and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff. Number six, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube doesn't like when I say some words, specifically a word that rhymes with Yahtzee. Mm -hmm. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, I have to mention it. The Duke was also referred to as a bad boy, but just how deep did these incidents cut? Was he like topless on a beach and he's bad, or was he dressed up as something horrible at a Halloween party? It was the latter. Before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology in 2005 because, huh, whoops, somebody got photos from that party. Did the royal dress up as the Beast from Beauty and the Beast? No. Did he dress up like a witch? No, it would have been fun, but no. Photos leaked of him wearing a World War II German soldier outfit. Can't say much here, but it was even equipped with a specific armband. Yeah, we can't show you either, but you get what I'm saying. This was a not great time. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way. He's a royal, and he does this instead. I don't know, it's very off-putting. Harry said afterwards, quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone, end quote. Wow, he, he really meant that one. Really came from the heart, that, that, that apology. It was a poor choice of costume, and I apologize, he says. Okay, number five. King Henry II. This is a quote that people believe was Nostradamus predicting the death of King Henry II, who actually was a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be scary. Hey, uh, how do I tell you this? Well, at one point, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible Henry King of France. Unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite vincible when he met his gruesome death at the age of 40. In the summer of 1559, a terrible jousting accident went awry and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I told you it because many think that Nostradamus predicted this. The jousting incident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and his skull by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. Yeah, he's jousting and then the eye, and then it happened. That sucks. Number four, Prince Charles the Vampire. Now, some of these theories, yeah, they're a bit out there. I didn't make them up. I wish I did, but I didn't. Some believers out there actually think Prince Charles is a vampire, a blood-sucking, flying, turning into a bat, looking vampire. I don't know. Why? Because Prince Charles is related to Vlad the Impaler. You know, that 15th century ruler who inspired the story of Dracula in Transylvania, who we're all pretty sure was a vampire. Now, it's a fun theory that went about, but Prince Charles having a piece of Romania is definitely helping out this case. I, we kind of believe this. The prince has been conserving forests and he even got property over there, so maybe he's a vampire, maybe not. Maybe he just likes property and castles. And Vlad the Impaler. I heard he's a great lad. A great Vlad. Number three, shapeshifters. Awesome, I'm not actually Taylor, I'm someone else pretending to be, that's cool. That's why I'm so energetic today. This next theory I wish I could claim for my own again, but it was actually former BBC presenter David Ick. He takes, the, he takes the cake himself, here we go. He has since revealed himself as a conspiracy theorist and one that surrounds the royal family had me stunned. 
Ick and quite a few others claim that the royal family is part of the Illuminati. Yeah, and then all of them earn their power because their human ancestor mated with reptilian aliens. They were clapping alien reptilians. That's how they became royals. That's the trick. You gotta clap some reptilian alien. David says the theory actually explains why royal families are obsessed with keeping their bloodlines clean with other royals. And you know, incest. <clears throat> but the biggest what the f part of all this has to be when David told the public that he knows people who have seen royal family members change into reptiles and then back into human form again. Number two, leaked letters. We'll end with some recent leaked letters. We love those, we love some gossip. We mentioned Princess Diana, well we've got more stuff, we've got more tea. In May 2018, the royal wedding, it was thought at the time that Meghan's father was absent because of a heart attack that he suffered days before. But a year or so later, it's revealed that Thomas Markle and the new Duchess weren't as close. There was some, uh, there was some drama, there was some beef going on in the family. Thomas spoke out against his own daughter. There was a scandal where Meghan spoke to Oprah, the tell-all that we all watched, and Meghan actually said to her father that if you tell me the truth about what happened, about working with paparazzi, then we can help and get through it. But he wasn't able to do that, and that for me has really resonated. Yeah, if my dad was working with paparazzi, showing them private letters as well, just for clout, I'd be upset too, as if my dad can't even open his iPad without me, let alone leak my letters. Number one, personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst thing ever or the best, but it's, it's kept me laughing for months now. Royals have been sweating constantly about other people trying to, you know, take them out, right? It's a scary job, everyone wants to attack you. I mentioned Boyd Jones on here a few times, that guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying, people are terrifying. Boyd Jones would go through the queen's drawers and you know, big ooh. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate any and all attacks. Be as safe as you can be, right? Of course. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Oh, have you heard about these kissing sheets, this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, that's normal. But they also had a guy who would get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter, know what I mean? King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure the bed wasn't poisoned. So you were required to make the king's bed every morning, but you also had to rub all the sheets down everywhere before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure they weren't poisoned. Yeah, sleep tight. I'll save here, boss. Here we go. Don't, don't mind the old medieval dad breath all over your pillows. You're safe for the night. That's so gross. I can't even sleep in a hotel sometimes, let alone some dude. I'm like, what are you doing? Get this guy out of here. Why is he kissing my bed? Clothes as well. That was also touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, kissing my sheets. No way. I think I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off. Get out of there. Thanks. Number 10. Harry and Meghan. Most recent on this list, and honestly, this whole ordeal has been pretty interesting to watch. It's rare for people to willingly leave the royal family, but based on the interviews conducted with Oprah, it isn't hard to see why they did it. The primary reason for their leaving were related to false articles being generated due to their fame, and moreover, the royal family's unwillingness to aid them on the matter. But it was clear that this was a long time coming, as Harry was frequently subjected to neglect by his father, not to mention he was the child of a previous marriage which we will talk about that later. Meghan, on the other hand, was subjected to extreme amounts of passive-aggressive racism, and the press piled on top of that likely became too much. As much of an anti-monarchist as I am, it's hard for me not to at least mildly sympathize and appreciate their leaving. Number 9. Prince Harry's Halloween what isn't hard to sympathize with is Harry's taste in costumes being fairly poor. Dressing as a German World War II officer, which is bad for a bunch of reasons I can't say by name but you should already know, was a poor idea and the public made sure that was known. Now as much as it's fun to pretend that Harry was the only one screwing up here, we can't really do that. And we have to note that the stated theme of the costume party was colonials and natives. Yeah, it's pretty bad. William apparently did also attend that one as well, but I'm certain he didn't dress in anything that similarly demeaned victims of cultural and genetic erasure. 
Right? Yeah, look, it, it's nice that Harry left the family, but as long as he bears the blood of royals, he will profit off everything that was spilt in their name. Spare will probably be an interesting read, though. Number eight, the Virgin Queen Elizabeth I. This is a historical channel, so I would like to grab a few times in which the royal family went through some historical troubles. Queen Elizabeth I is one of the most well known British rulers in history. Her life has been extremely well documented, and she's also the possessor of an interesting title the Virgin Queen. It is claimed that she had never been romantic with anyone, though this is hotly contested as while it's clear that she very well did not have any official children and never officially married, these are the tutors we are talking about. You know, there is no conclusive evidence that this ever occurred of course, and that would become even more true as more of her reputation was based entirely on the notion that she was unwed. But dude, the tutors, I mean, yeah. I doubt it. Number seven, Princess Anne's dog. The first member of the royal family to ever be convicted of a criminal offense, and it was this one. Yeah, see, Prince Anne liked dogs and decided on April 1st that she'd take her dogs out for a walk. Before we get into the details of this, I want to make something clear. Not all dog breeds are bad by default, though different breeds require different degrees of attention and care to ensure they're probably sociable. I have to be honest, but when you're a member of the royal family by blood or leash, I imagine that people are going to have a hard time house training you. So it's no surprise that there were two bites that day as a result of the poor social training the dog had received. As a result, Princess Anne pled guilty to the charge under the Possession of Dangerous Dogs Act, which is a thing in the UK. Look, dogs are great. I'm a cat person. All animals need to be raised with attention and care. Same goes for people. It's pretty clear to me that the royals are equally as bad at doing both. Number six, Edward VIII. Here is a historical doozy for you. Anyone remember the reign of King Edward VIII? No? Well, you probably blinked, because it only lasted 10 months. From the moment of his ascension, Ed Boy was clearly aiming for something weird. He was starting to get a little more open about politics, which is a big no-no in the royal family, unless you're being racist, then it's okay. He also wanted the face that would end up on his coin to point in a different direction. These did actually get printed, but are super rare. He also wanted to marry a woman, but was told he couldn't, so he started getting a little annoyed, and eventually abdicated the throne for love. Hmm. Well, we're glad he moved on to better things, and there are no embarrassing photos of him meeting with certain people from certain countries prior to certain wars. None at all. Number five, Princess Margaret's affairs. This isn't really much more than tabloid fluff, but this scandal was a massive pain for the entire royal family, and it was pretty clear that she couldn't care less. A whole bunch of dudes got involved in this, and it wasn't until I learned that it didn't involve Pete Townsend of The Who, but Pete Townsend of Who Cares, and guess what? Just like every single romantic relationship covered by the press, it sucked for everyone involved, but ultimately nothing all that interesting really happened at all. Number four, covering up Prince Andrew. It's mostly atrocities from here, so buckle up. I cannot say what was alleged to have happened with this case, but what I can say is that there's smoke, then there's fire. The entirety of Prince Andrew's existence has been one massive sham, and the fact that the royal family continues to deny knowledge of it in any way would be laughable if it weren't so teeth grindingly frustrating. I do genuinely believe with all my heart that they knew and they didn't do anything about it until it was going to get on their shoes. If you don't know what I'm talking about then you can dive down that rabbit hole yourself. You've got your rules. I've got mine. Number three, Prince Philip. I have many words for Prince Philip. Words like good, which are immediately followed by riddance. Yeah, Elizabeth's husband was just about the least interested royal in even mildly disguising his attempt for anyone that wasn't a man, white, or as rich as he was. There are so many quotes, so many, they're all horrible. I don't want to say them here, I don't know if I can say them here. Like there's taking the mask off and then there's just being an absolute loser. I've heard dudes with the stars and bars tattooed under their breasts say the same things this mummy has said over the course of their equally worthless existences. Not to mention a similar proclivity in dating partners as Philip and Elizabeth are cousins. Dude passed at 99 which was just about 99 years younger than he looked and 99 older than he deserved. Number two, the Beaux Leons. When Nerissa and Catherine Beaux-Leon were born as the cousins of Queen Elizabeth, they were said to have passed at birth. However, it was revealed that they'd in fact lived, but due to their classification as imbeciles, they were abandoned at Earlswood Hospital and their existence was hushed up completely. Seriously, 
No one went to their funerals, no one cared. The people that are the face of the country will abandon those they view as worthless for no better reason than to keep their image pure of mad blood. They were never visited, no one cared, and it isn't uncommon. JFK had a similar thing happen with his sister, except that was even hidden from him. These are your politicians, your rulers. Look at them go. Wow, look at them. Going all the way over there. And in at number one, you kind of had to guess it, it's Diana. The entirety of this was a nightmare for everyone. More tabloid crap, a marriage that happened out of convenience, and the straight up mistreatment of a woman made public via dishonest journalistic methods, which was then immediately followed by her unbelievably tragic passing. But Diana was easily the only royal who actually tried to do something with the power she had. Even if it was lip service, just touching a victim of AIDS at the time was enough to change the minds of an entire public. She actually stood for something, but the royal family's image will never change, and it'll never have to. 